Jesus, but we looked at Jesus himself and we talked about the miracle of love, that God is love. Let's just uh, remind ourselves this morning on, with regards to the miracle of the virgin birth because really, if the virgin birth is not true, then there's no point in you and I being here this morning. And uh, everything hinges on, on that. So let's read these verses of Scripture, and uh, Luke chapter 1, we'll read verses 26 through 39, and then we'll move over to chapter 2 and read verses 1 through 11, then I'll have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll get into our lesson for today. So the Bible says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Father, we, well, let's, well, I was going to have to read chapter 2. Let's pray, then we'll read chapter 2. Father, we ask that you'd bless our, our Bible study this morning, that uh, you would guide us and direct us, that you would teach us these truths, remind us of these truths. Uh, Lord, help us to make application to our lives as we look at this. And see these scriptures, and we're so thankful for the Word of God. We're so thankful for our salvation. We're thankful for the cross and the precious blood that was shed on the cross 2,000 years ago. We're reminded this time of year as we think about the birth of Christ that Jesus came to die and pay for our sin. And how glad we are for that, how thankful we are for that. So bless the Bible study this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now let's go over to chapter 2, and we'll read verses 1 through 11. And the Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen. So let's talk about this this morning, the virgin birth, and um, just to think about some things. Because, you know, uh, over the years, critics of the Bible, those who want to attack the truth of the Bible, one of the greatest truths of the Bible 
has uh, been, a, people have attacked it, the whole idea of the virgin birth. And of course, in chapter number one, in verse 34, Mary asked that question. She said unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And uh, I think we all, just by way of review, but I think we all understand that um, when the Bible talks about Joseph and Mary being espoused, um, they, that was part of the Jewish tradition, and they had yet, not yet come together and consummated their marriage physically. And um, so this declaration that's brought to, to uh, Mary and also to Joseph, well, that would have been quite astonishing, don't you think? I mean, for an angel to, to appear, you know, sometimes I think we think that, you know, in the Bible days, whether it's the early days that, you know, that, it, it, that the New Testament records, or in the Old Testament, there was just angels popping in and out all the time. But it wasn't necessarily that way. These were, you know, we, even when you study many of the miracles in the Old Testament, they're really, uh, it, it, they, there just wasn't miracles going on all the time. That's what made the miracles. If they were going on all the time, they wouldn't have been miracles. And so this declaration here is, uh, uh, obviously, it's a big deal. Um, and Mary has a very legitimate question. How shall this be? I mean, I'm not going to have a child. I, I, Joseph and I haven't even come together yet physically as husband and wife. How can this be? But as I said earlier, the, the virgin birth. Well, you tell me. Help me out this morning. Uh, the virgin birth. So why is it central? Why is it essential to Christianity and everything that we believe? Because quite frankly, if it if it did not happen, our entire faith just crumbles. There, we're, we're, just following, we're just following a man. That's, that's what we're following. And we are, in some sense, following a man. We'll talk about this in a little, little bit, but he's a different type of man. But why is it essential? Because uh, if it's not true, at most, Jesus was a great teacher or a great philosopher. Or some people have said he was... A madman. So somebody help me. Tell me why is it true? Somebody, if you many of you have been Christians a long time, uh, and what well, if someone came to you and, and asked you about well, what about this virgin birth thing? Major, go ahead. All right, he didn't inherit the sin of Adam. That's true. So that's uh, let's let's build upon that. Why is that then important? Yeah, it makes God the father. And father. Makes God the Father, the Father of Jesus. Okay, let's keep let's keep building. Yes. Well, like all of us, he would have been born with a sin nature, and uh, obviously, you couldn't die for our sins if he was sinful himself. Couldn't die for our sins. Why not? True. Exactly true. What you've just said. But let's just. I'm going to play the part of the. I, I don't know anything about Christianity. You know, I've been living on this island all my life, and all of a sudden, uh, you show up with a Bible, and you're starting to tell me about Jesus and who this Jesus guy is, and and uh, so why couldn't, why not, why couldn't he uh, die for my sins? I mean, other people die for, other people die for other th good reasons. I mean, we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the towers coming down in New York City, and literally uh, thousands of or hundreds of police officers and firemen died trying to rescue people. Why? Why? I mean, that was a good thing that they did. <laughs> so why couldn't he? Wow. I stumped you? What's that? If he said you'd have to pay for his own sin. If he sinned, he would have to pay for his own sin. But didn't he? He hung on a cross. I mean, that's that's a pretty... That's... I mean, it seems to me that's... Again, I'm just giving you a hard time, that's all. But that's true. I mean, yes? The sacrifice wouldn't have been perfect. Okay. Somebody else had their hand up somewhere? Yes? Right, that's kind of what Cal was alluding to as well. It's true. 
True. Anybody else? Yes? He's only the second man not to be at the seat of Adam. The first being Adam himself. Right. That's a very good the seed of a woman. So the starter trick goes all the way back to Genesis. If he be not of a virgin, then he's of the seed of Adam. And he's not the fulfillment of prophecy. He's not the fulfillment of prophecy. Very good. Anybody else? That's the Christmas uh, hymn, uh, Second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Those are all good. Yes? As the Son of God, he has the power of life and death. So if it wasn't God that died, there would be no resurrection. Yeah, that's good. Say that again. As the Son of God, he has the power over life and death. So if he wasn't God, uh, there'd be no resurrection once he died. If, there wasn't, you know, if he wasn't God, there'd be no resurrection. Okay, good. Well, these are all very good things. Yes? Well, I would go with, because even before God created man, he already knew that man was going to fail. True. And uh, he knew that the only, he knew the only way to rescue mankind was to rescue them himself. Okay. Good. These are all very good. Anybody else? We're kind of covering it all here. Okay. All right, well, let's look at some things. So, we remind, so, so from just for what many of you have already said, so that, so that we understand Jesus is the God-man. Amen? He is the God-man. And the, the, it is the virgin birth that accomplished that. Just as I forget, somebody said this, or maybe several, several of you said this. If he had been born of a, a man, and a, if, he had been, if Mary and Joseph... Uh, if Joseph was his, was his father, he would have been born into this world with a sinful nature. And so we're taught that because that's what the scriptures teach us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For as by one man sin entered into the world, that would be Adam, and death passed upon all men, for all men have sinned. Except for Jesus. Do you want to say something? Right. Yeah. That's what. Yeah. That's the. That's the. What I said earlier. Like, if he's not who he said he is, then he he's a madman. You know, the, the, the people would have heard him say those things before Abraham. How could that be? You're you're not even fifty years old. They said to him, and you're saying you existed before. So of course he declared himself uh, to be God. Um, and someone else said, uh, so if you were not man, he could not die. And if you were not God, his death would not have the infinite value that it has. That's all tied into it. So let's just look here and, and, and these three points that I put on our lesson this morning. Number one is this. So Jesus came to reveal God to man. Now, it's not that God hadn't been revealed to man prior to Jesus coming, because we'll talk about that God had. Um, for instance, on your handout, I have these three points. God, God above us, that's God's revelation to man through nature, through the creation. Then there's God against us, that's the revelation of the law. The law really condemned man, it brought condemnation to man, because no one could live out the law. Uh, the, Paul would say in the book of Galatians, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So that's what the law did. And as hard as you, you possibly tried to keep all of the law, then you just couldn't do it. It taught us that, you know, just the Ten Commandments alone, uh, just try to keep the Ten Commandments without breaking the Ten Commandments. 
the Ten Commandments brings condemnation. I'm sure if it hasn't happened to you, I know it's happened to me, uh, or you've heard people say this, well, how, how, you know, you, how do you think you get to heaven? Well, you've got to keep the Ten Commandments. You know, if you keep the Ten Commandments, you've got a pretty good shot. <laughs> Except there isn't a person alive who hasn't at some point in, their t in, t in time told a lie, right? And, um, or maybe you're that exception, and maybe you're here, maybe you're here today. Um, but Jesus upped that. He said, even if you think about some of these things, just the thought about it is sin. So we're reminded of that. But the revelation, God among us, that's the revelation of the gospel. When, when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. It always, when I think about Jesus becoming a man and Jesus, the creator becoming the creation, taking on himself the form of human nature, like you and I, yet of course without sin. If you just, I mean, for me personally, whenever I just sit and meditate on that and contemplate that, it's mind boggling to me that God would do that. Because as I've often said, and then, of course, dying for the sins of mankind, and we'll talk about that too as we kind of get into this, but the whole idea of that is so, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I often said this, every other religion in the world, quote unquote, teaches that if you, as a human, kind of take a step up, if you can, if you can take the step up in that religion, you can be like God, you can become like God, and yet... Biblical Christianity teaches that the perfect one, that holy thing, you know, the scripture said, the holy one, he didn't take a step up. He, he actually took a step down to become like humanity so that you and I could have a way. He is the way. But when Jesus came into the world, it was a different revelation. Don't you think of God to mankind? I mean... Look at it on your handout, 1 Timothy 3.16. The Bible says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then received up into glory. That verse there kind of gives the whole context of Jesus coming into the world and why he came into the world and then his ascension into heaven. But the phrase there, that God was manifest in the flesh. God became a man. The second person of the Godhead appeared in human flesh and in, in, in nature. That's like an astonishing mystery. I think because we hear it all the time, we just kind of accept it as, you know, well, yeah, yeah. No, it's astonishing. I think it's astonishing that God would do that. The creator, creator of the world becomes part of the creation. And then to be born in a stable, uh, a cradle, in a manger, the infinite deity and finite flesh all met in one person. Get that? The infinite deity and yet finite flesh. Because we know that in his flesh... Um, he tired, he thirsted, he hungered, he, had, he experienced the emotions that you and I deal with. Um, Mike and I were talking this week in our one-on-one uh, -on -one discipleship that he and I are doing about the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And just in those two words, you see the emotions of the Savior, you know, the grief that... Uh, uh, in my mind, there's a number of things that's there, but that's, of course, when, when Lazarus was dead, and then he would shortly be raised from the dead. But, he, but as uh, Mary and Martha were there, and they were just brokenhearted, um, some have said, well, that's Jesus weeping because they, they just didn't have faith. I, I'm not sure that's the case so much as I think he was experiencing and understanding the depth of the grief that they were going through having lost Lazarus. And um, I think we forget that, um, you know, this, 
just experiencing that, Jesus knows. He knows. And, um, but he came, and he came to experience all of that. And it's Jesus coming into this world is revealing God to man in a way that God had never been revealed to man prior. Philippians chapter 2 and verses 6 and 7 on your handout. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. That word there, equal, where it says to be equal with God, if you do a little word study on that word equal, it means to be uh, qualitatively equal and quantitatively equal. I think I got that right. Uh, what it really means is Jesus is God. That's what it means. And, um, and he reveals himself to us in, in that way. And so in the text here, in, in, in Luke chapter 1, in verse number 31, so in this announcement, And thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And uh, in verse number 35, the Bible says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So here in this announcement, God is about to take upon himself the form of humanity and um, reveal himself to mankind in a way that he has never revealed himself as of yet at this point uh, in all of human history uh, to mankind. Any comments on that? Any thoughts? Let's we'll move on to the second point. God revealing himself to man. All right. So let's, sit, let's talk about this second point then. All wrapped up in the virgin birth. So Jesus came to redeem man from sin. Again, verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. In Matthew's account, when uh, the angel Gabriel is um, making this announcement to Joseph and preparing Joseph uh, for what is about to take place. The angel says this, and she shall bring forth a son and thou shall call his name Jesus. And then the angel says, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Jesus came into the world and the virgin birth is, is essential, not only in the sense that that, that Jesus came to reveal God to man, but Jesus came to redeem man, you and I, from sin, from sin. Job said this, Job 19, 25. He said, for I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Or Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He is the great redeemer. He came for you and I with regards to our sin nature. So three sub points here with regards to the world, um, to the word redeem. So first, the word redeem, sometimes it means to buy in the market to buy in the market. You redeem something, you've gone to the market, you've purchased it, you've redeemed it. Uh, it's a transaction that takes place. And that was what took place on the cross 2,000 years ago, the greatest transaction of all time, when your sin and my sin was being paid for on the cross. And um, I'm so thankful for that. But as already has been said by many of the comments, that that transaction could never have taken place unless Jesus was born into this world without sin. Um, because only a perfect sacrifice could be offered for the sins of mankind. Any other sacrifice would be, uh, or any other person, that sacrifice would have been an imperfect sacrifice. It's the virgin birth that made that redemption possible, that transaction uh, possible. And then secondly, sometimes the word redeemed has this idea, to buy out of the market. And uh, so that's the justification of uh, our redemption. So what do I mean by that? 
the justification, uh, you know, the Bible says we are justified freely. Well, how does that, where, how does that, so here I am again, and um, come on, you've, you've met me on this island somewhere, and um, <laughs> what is this, what do you mean justification? What does that mean? I've been justified freely by what Jesus has done for me. Yeah, sometimes it's put that way, just as if you've never sinned. So Jesus died and he paid for my sin. And when God the Father looks at me, he looks at me just as if I've never sinned. Okay? What else? Anything else? Justification. Yes? Just as if I never would. And just as if I never would. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. Yeah. And just as if I never would. What else? Yes. Uh, with the blood of Jesus that you can justify the into the kingdom. Yes, it's true. In a real sense, God, the Father looks at you as if you are in Christ. He looks at you as if you are Jesus. You know, you're not Jesus, but you understand what I'm saying? When we were down uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, when we were down, I helped my, or brought some of my stuff down to Louisville, uh, or my, not my stuff, but my daughter's stuff to Louisville, because um, they just moved there. I, Gideon was with me, as I told you last week. So we went to the Ark, which is about an hour and a half north of where they live. And the Ark is really a picture, really, is, is it not of our salvation when Abraham, uh, excuse me, when Noah entered into the Ark, um, with his wife and his three sons and three daughter-in-laws. Um, that's a picture of you and I entering into faith with Jesus. And um, they were secure in the ark. You and I are secure in Christ. I've often, when I'm sharing the gospel with someone, I use this example. I say to them, now listen, the Bible is obviously it's the word of God and it represents Jesus dying on the cross. And then whatever object I have, if it's my cell phone or whatever, or a pen, I'll say, now this, this, is, this is me. And, um, and let's just say everything that's on here represents me. And, um, and like many of our cell phones today, it has all the information of the world in it, and we know the world is a sinful place. But one day someone presented the gospel to me, and I realized that I was a sinner in need of a savior. And so that day, me, put my trust in him, Jesus Christ, and now I'm in Christ. So now when I stand before God, God doesn't see me any longer. And when you're, if you're saved here this morning, when you stand before God, he doesn't see you any longer. Who does he see? He sees Jesus Christ. You are in Christ. And so we're secure in him. And, I, and, and, and I'm so thankful for that. But that happened because of the redemption. We were, we, the transaction that took place on the cross. Uh, we were bought out of the market. By the way, what other ramifications does that have? We are bought out of, out of the marketplace of sin. Uh, really, it's, what do I mean that third sub-point sub there? We've been set free from the market. That's an, emancipation. What does that mean? We have been set free from the marketplace of sin. What does that mean? Because that, that is, that is, um, that is part of our, the transaction that takes place. It's not only that we're saved and our sin's been paid for, and now we're in Christ, and now we're on our way to heaven, but there's a value to that right here and now in the world in which we're living in before we get to heaven. See, you should have all had your second cup of coffee this morning. You know I'd ask you all these questions. I'm asking these questions because I'm tired this morning. <laughs> Okay, we're no longer living in sin. We're no longer, yeah, that's, that's where I'm headed with this. That's true. But I want you to, I want to expand on that a bit. Yes. Uh, once we're justified, um, we're born again and made a new creature. Thus we don't have the desire to sin. We don't have the desire to sin. It's true. Sometimes we do have the desire to sin. But I understand what you're saying. You're right. 
So that kind of leads us to the word of another Bible term, sanctification, right? We're sanctified in Christ. What does that mean? Not only that we're set apart and we're on our way to heaven, but, but you're all on the right track here. You, the whole idea of, of being emancipated. Yes? Yeah, we don't need to be a slave to it any longer. We've been, we've had the power of the Holy Spirit of God living within us. And um, we don't, we no longer have to be a slave to our sin. We don't have to be in bondage to sin. We've been set free from that. Um, one of the reasons Jesus was manifested in John chapter, in 1 John chapter, I forget what chapter it's in, but it's 1 John chapter, it might be in chapter 3. He was manifested not only to take away our sin, but to destroy the works of Satan. And uh, we have, we, the Bible clearly teaches us that part of this transaction not only sets us free with the sense that we're no longer in the eyes of the Father guilty of sin, but now we are, we, we are no longer under the bondage of sin. And uh, that's a tremendous part of this transaction. And that's how you and I, we have victory. Uh, actually, that's probably not even a correct phrase, we have victory over sin. Jesus had victory over sin. We, in, we are able to enjoy the benefits of that victory over sin as we depend upon, especially uh, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit of God, uh, to work in our lives and to give us that victory. Does that make sense? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. So go attack the works of Satan. That's keep going. That's right. How? How? How do we do that as believers? Well, by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. Because a dead man has no choices. I have to be made alive first. And now I have a choice. I can choose God or I can choose death. It really does come down to that simple choice for the believer. Before we had no choice, we followed the lust of our flesh. And now we're called to pull down strongholds, philosophies that stack themselves against Christ in this kingdom. By casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Right? We have the weapons too. Of, now we have the weapons of our warfare. We didn't have those weapons before. You know, go Ephesians chapter 6 spells out the armor of faith, right? The, the uh, breastplate of righteousness. Uh, our, our, our loins girt about with truth. The shield of faith. The sword of the spirit. The helmet of salvation. Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. All of this we've been equipped with to live a victorious life. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I've come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. So there is no reason that you and I as believers, um, now, now sometimes this happens, but the reality is we should never be defeated by sin because the Lord has, uh, when, when a Christian is defeated by sin, it's because in my mind, he or she has laid aside all that God has provided for us to have victory over it. It's not that we don't sometimes struggle I get that. Anyhow, we're almost we're out of time. I got to move on here. So the virgin birth is important not only for the redemption of man from sin, but lastly, Jesus coming to reconcile man to God, and to Colossians one nineteen uh, and verse twenty, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, and I'm, I'm sorry, but the rest of the verse should have been on there, and I must have deleted it by mistake. But you have been reconciled in all things, and I don't have the rest of that verse to memory, so I'm going to really quickly turn there and read it. Um, And you hath he reconciled all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now 
hath he reconciled. Wow, it's a wonderful truth right there. So the virgin birth, and so in our, in our text, real quickly, just look at verses 31 and 35 again. They shall call his name Jesus. And then again in verse 35, this holy thing shall come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born shall be called the Son of God. The Son of the highest it speaks of his deity. The Son of God, it speaks of his humanity. And by the way, when... Real quickly, I should have said this earlier because we were out of time. But I was reading through this, and I never really thought about this. But in my mind, look at verse 38. After verse 37, uh, the scriptures say, For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now, I can't be sure. This is just my own opinion. But I think it's at that moment when Mary accepted these truths that at that moment is when conception began. That, that at that moment the Holy Spirit came upon her and she was with child. And um, because all throughout the scriptures, you know, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him the righteousness. It was, her, it was that moment in time when she just accepted these truths. And uh, maybe not, maybe I'm wrong. But none of this is possible without the validity of the virgin birth. This allowed Jesus to become the substitute bearing the penalty of the sinner, of the sinner and restoring a relationship that sin had severed. A general belief that Christ died for the whole world is not enough. A personal conviction that one's own sin has been born and paid for by Jesus Christ is required. That's what it means to be born again. And um, that's our Bible study for this morning. We've run we've run out of time. But thank you, many of you, uh, for, for adding your uh, input. Let's pray. Father, bless our morning worship service. Be with Pastor Ethan as he preaches. Please guide and direct all that he says. Help us as we, we not only worship you with our attentiveness to the preaching of the word, but we worship you as we lift up our voices and sing and praise you. We'll worship you with our offering. We'll just worship you with our whole bodies and our whole being and our minds this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you, and our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.